of time. Well, I do this a lot of times. But once a year, you know, I thought I better get to work. <laughs> song, John. Thank you and Gary. Appreciate it very much. Uh, it's hard to believe. <clears throat> so another Christmas is right here on top of us. I look at my calendar and you got things that you have to do. And I'll put it down and, you know, there's an appointment or, or something and you'll say, well, you know, it's March, you know, March 15th, 22, and you think, yeah, well, that's way out there. And the next thing you know, it's next week. You have to have to get everything lined up for it to happen. Well, <clears throat> week nine, chapter three, we'll finish chapter three tonight, verses 22 through 26. So we're finishing up, <clears throat> finishing up Peter's sermon that he had started on Solomon's porch, which actually started back at verse 11. So instead of going through all that, last week I, I started just so we could keep up with it. Tonight, I'm just going to start at verse 22, and we'll, we'll go down to verse 26, which will finish that up. So verse 22 in Acts chapter 3, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, and him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet, capital T, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities, turning you away from your iniquities. So Peter finishes his sermon on the porch. Father, we thank you again tonight. We're able to be here together and study this word together. Give you thanks for those who have already tuned in with us. 
by, by way of Facebook. And those who may pull this up later on YouTube, we just ask that Holy Spirit, you just put the power behind these words, not my words, but behind your words, because that's, that's where hearts are changed. So now I just ask you, Lord, as we look into this lesson, this holy word, as we worship in song, giving in prayer, now we worship in this word, God is Holy Spirit, that we might see that, which will help us be better disciples and better evangelists in these last days. In your name, Jesus, we say it by faith, and all the saints will say we love you, Lord. Amen. 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 All right. If you noticed the paragraph on your note there, and you probably did, I didn't change it. It's the same as it was. After, after telling them, Peter, after telling them they had Jesus crucified, Peter now offers them a way of forgiveness from God. And again, he connects Jesus with the prophets of the Old Testament. And as I put there, keep in mind, there was no New Testament at that time. The, the thing to, and I think I've told you this, but in case I haven't, <clears throat> I got a new memory, I just don't remember. But uh, I, I think I may have told you this before, but keep in mind, one of, one of the big issues that, that Peter has, or that all the disciples have, with this new church, and it's really new, it's a grassroots movement in this society that's coming through a religion of hundreds of years and has changed the way that they have worshipped and the way that they understood how they were to have favor with God. And all that has changed in, in a short span of really, you know, three years or so that, that Jesus was on the earth when, when he was doing this. Now, what we're reading here, I think this is what, what grips us the most. We think that, you know, this happened one day and then they wrote this book the next day. That's not how it happened at all. You know, this, this stuff has already played out. And then God used these writers like Luke to go back and to put down for you and I the things that had happened. So before this New Testament was actually written, a lot of stuff happened and a lot of stuff took place after Jesus died all the way up until the time that, that Luke penned his gospel and that Luke put this acts together. So keep in mind that when this church started, it was a grassroots movement based on the resurrection from the dead of one man, and that was Jesus. And that was hard for them to accept as Jews. So what Peter has done in this sermon, and I say Peter did it, it's the Holy Spirit working through Peter that makes that happen. It's got to be, because Peter was, was I won't say just a fisherman, but, but Peter knew the power of the Holy Spirit that came upon him at Pentecost. So he knew then how to yield to what the Spirit led him to say. So Luke records the words that Peter preached of. And what the Holy Spirit did through Peter is he made that connection to the God of the Old Testament as they would have looked at it. And that's how they would have looked at it. Now we know there's not two gods. There's not a God of the Old Testament and Jesus is God of the New Testament. No. There are people who believe that. That is not true at all. That is absolutely not true. So the Holy Spirit was using Peter to, if you want to say, bridge that gap. He wanted the Jews to understand that this was not a new religion. Jesus is not a different God. He's not a new God. But that God had opened the door for them to have fellowship with him. And that did not happen in the Old Testament outside of Moses or Abraham or David or Samuel or Saul or, you know, the common person had no access to God. The priests were the only ones that made intercession for the people. The common Joe, as I would call him, you know, he had no, I, I guess you could say, no chance of having fellowship with this almighty God. God had chosen those he was going to deal with. So they had to depend on the priests and on the intercessors to do that. But Jesus changed all of that on the cross. And now he's making it, he's making it a personal thing for every person, whether Jew or whether Greek. And that was hard for them to wrap their minds around. That was hard for them to, to accept. 
So that's what this sermon was about. You know, that, that the first sermon he preached when he told them, he said, look, what you guys are witnessing here, you remember his first sermon right after they got out of the upper room in Pentecost and they heard the disciples preaching in their own languages. And his first sermon explained what that was. And he connected that to Joel. And he said, this is what Joel had written about. This, what you see happening before your eyes is what the Old Testament writer Joel was, was prophesying about. And that's come to life in your lifetime. You're witnessing that happening right here. And that was his first sermon. And he said, you know, you, you guys, <laughs> you guys kill Christ and let a murderer get loose. I mean, that's how he, he led into it. But then he began to say, but God, out of his infinite mercy and his infinite grace, had all this plan so that all this would take place, and it's going to be for your benefit. Now, he, he, he's not only got the preaching behind him, but then when they healed this lame man, it really, it really opened the eyes of those who may have had doubts about the first gift. The first miracle was the tongues. That was the first miracle when they heard everybody in their own language. That was a miracle. But then this miracle, that this lame man got, got his strength back, jumped, came to life, jumped up, ran into the temple, and there was no explanation for that. There was no other way to explain that other than the same Jesus that brought Lazarus out of the tomb, the same Jesus that raised that paralytic when they let him down through the roof. Remember that guy? And Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. The same Jesus that did those things is the same Jesus that did this thing. The only difference is he's not here in bodily form. He is here in spirit by way of his disciples. It's not the disciples. You know, they looked at Peter and John and he said, you're looking at us like, like we're godly men. He said, it's not us. It is Jesus working through us. And that, that's going to be that's going to be hard to teach. So you'll see that, but that's where he's at. So here in verse 22 and 23, he brings Moses into it, which he had to do. We're going to see that, that Jesus did that as well. He said, 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. And him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And in 23, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. That's what Peter's quoting here. The only difference that you find in the Old Testament quoting is when Peter said, that the person that will not listen to that prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. In Deuteronomy, the text says it will return unto him. But it's the same difference. It's the same difference. It, it means that you're going to die. <laughs> you, you either be utterly destroyed, as Peter says, or you're going to die, and you'll, you'll be returned unto God. But Moses was prophesying about another prophet thing is, they didn't know when that prophet was going to come. See, Moses said he'll raise up another prophet. Now, if you'd have been there and Moses had made that statement to you, and Moses would have said, I'm going to raise up another prophet, God's going to raise up another prophet like me, when do you think he would have done that? I mean, don't put no thought into it. He's going to raise up another prophet like me. As soon as he died. Right? I mean, isn't that what you're going to, wouldn't you assume that? Moses said he's going to raise up another prophet like me, so you got to listen to him. Well, Moses died, so if I was in that group, I'd say, well, I'm waiting on that next one. Moses is gone. I'm waiting on that next prophet. That, that's what you're dealing with when you're talking about prophecy and bringing that all the way up to Christ. See, we're, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage because we know as much as we know. And that hampers us in our understanding of this basic knowledge that Peter is having to, to give out to these who don't know. 
who didn't know, who had no idea of what you and I know. But that's, that's what he was up against. In your notes, your answer, the Jews held to Moses as the authority to fellowship with God. Uh, I mean, they, they almost worshipped Moses. They didn't, but they almost did. Because according to them, he was the man. I mean, Moses was the man. <clears throat> now, Peter is showing them that Jesus is the one whom they should hear now. Now, that in itself should, should cause you to think, well, how do I know that Peter's right? I mean, seriously. You know, you know the Pharisees, they, they were the legal experts. And, and the scribes, they were the legal experts. Yes, they knew there was going to be a Messiah. Yes, they knew that God was going to send a Messiah. But there had already been people who raised up claiming to be somebody. We'll find that in this book, too. So when Peter says, this Jesus that you crucified, who's come back to life, is the one that brought this man back to life. So then he says, Moses even prophesied about Jesus. No, Moses didn't call him by name because he didn't know who it was going to be. But he knew there would be somebody. He knew there would be a prophet as God gave it to him. Turn to Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 28 through 36. Now keep in mind that Peter is making a connection with these Jews to Moses. That he, he's wanting to link Christ to Moses. He, he's wanting to understand that Jesus is not a different God. Look in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 through 36 here. Well, yeah, I go to chapter 9. Let's see the king. All right. <clears throat> now, it, it came to pass, it's the transfiguration. It came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he, Jesus, took Peter and John and James and they went up on the mountain to pray. Now, I picked Luke's gospel because who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. That's why I'm reading it from Luke's gospel. <clears throat> As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, look at here, two men talked with him. Who were, these men were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory, not in body, in glory, and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Wow. They were talking to Jesus about Jesus going to the cross. But Peter, old Peter, the one preaching this sermon, Luke said that Peter and those with him, they were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake now, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened. Then it happened. As they were parting from him, as Moses and Elijah was parting, going away from him, that Peter said to Jesus. Now watch this. Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make how many? Three. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. See that little line right there? That, that line tells us, think about that for a minute. And then it says, not knowing what he said. Now when it says not knowing what he said, it doesn't mean he don't know that he said those words. Peter doesn't know the impact those words were going to have. He, he didn't realize the impact of that. But here's what happened when he said that. While he was saying this, I mean just as he was saying it, a cloud came and overshadowed him. Now this ain't one of these nice little pretty white fluffy clouds that just you remember that cloud that come on, come up on the mountain when Moses was up there, <coughs> came down on the mountain that was dark and fire and thunder and lightning, and the people screamed and cried and said, we're scared of this God, we don't want anything to do with him, you go talk to him, Moses, and you come back and talk to us. That's about the way this cloud was. 
It wasn't just a cloud. It was a black, dark cloud, and it overshadowed them. It, it, they couldn't see anything, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. They wouldn't go walking out of it. They was in it. And a voice came out of the cloud. Look what the voice said. This is my beloved son. Hear him! Exclamation point. That, that wasn't just a little, uh, this is my son. All of a sudden, a dark cloud comes up on them, and they're in fear, and this voice says, this is my son. You hear him. Don't you worry about Moses. Don't you worry about Elijah. You listen to my son. It's not about Moses any longer. It's not about Elijah any longer. You listen to my son. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet. And they told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. Why didn't they tell anybody? Because they wouldn't have believed it. They would have thought these guys are crazy. Surely this didn't happen. And Peter's not about to stand up and say, Secure us to death. And I stood up and said, We need three tabernacles. We need one for Jesus. See, it put Jesus and Moses and Elijah on the same plane. Can you see that? And God stopped it. No. This is my beloved son. You hear him. So now Peter's preaching on that portico. Same Holy Spirit. Same Jesus. And on that portico he says, In days past you have listened to Moses. But Moses said there's going to be a prophet that's going to come after him. And that's the one you've got to listen to. Now turn to John chapter 5. <clears throat> Look what Jesus has to say. John chapter 5. Remember, Jesus said he didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. Look at John 45 and 46 in chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus said, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses. Now the Jews held to Moses. Jesus said, I don't accuse you to the Father, but there is one who does, Moses, in whom you trust. See that? In whom you trust. You're trusting in Moses. He's the one that accuses you to the Father. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. There you go. Cut and dry. That, that, kind of, that kind of takes it out of it, doesn't it? Now you can't say, well, Moses said, but Jesus said. Pharisees tried that a time or two. But Jesus said, no. You, you think I'm the one that's accusing you to the Father of being sinners. No, you trust in Moses. Moses is the one who's accusing you. It was Moses' law that made us sinners. Remember, Paul did a good thing about the law. He said before the law came, there were sinners in the world, but they didn't know they were sinners because there wasn't any law. But now that the law has come, they know they're sinners, so the law convicts us of sin, but the law can't save us from sin. So Jesus said, you trust in Moses, he's the one that's accusing you of sinners to the Father, because he's the one that gave the law. He's the one you trust in. He's not going to be able to save you. Verse 47, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? If you don't believe what Moses has said to you and told you to do, then how are you going to believe what I tell you to do? Because he wrote about me, Jesus said. So that's what Jesus had to say about Moses. And then look at John chapter 9, verses 27 through 34. Now, I'm taking you through all of this, through this deep study here, so that you know where Peter is coming from. He stands on that porch, and he says, Moses said that there would be a prophet who was going to come after me. John chapter 9, verses 27 through 34. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, 
and said, I have told you already, or not Jesus, but this guy, the one that, that had, re had his sight restored by Jesus. He answered the Pharisees and he said, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him. And they said, you are his disciple, but we are what? But we are Moses' disciple. You're his disciple. Yeah, you know, he just he just restored your sight. So you're his disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. Look, look what? We know that God spoke to Moses. They know that. <laughs> As for this fellow, Jesus, we do not know where he is from. We don't know where Jesus, we don't know where he's from. We know where he came out of. The man answered and said to him, why, this is a marvelous thing. Here, here's a good bit of sarcasm in the Bible. <laughs> this guy said, well, that's a marvelous thing. You don't know where he's from, yet he's opened my eyes. In other words, duh. Who else can open my eyes except God? And yet you say, I don't know where he's from. He's got to be from God, right? Or he couldn't open my eyes. Well, that made him mad. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, the man said. But if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And since the world began, it's been unheard of, listen, that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. Moses never opened the eyes of a blind man. That's basically what he's saying. If this man were not from God, bingo, there it is. He could do nothing. He burnt her face up with that. What do you mean you don't know where he's from? And they answered and said to him, uh, you were completely born in sins. So were they. <laughs> you were completely born in sins. And you were teaching us. And they cast him out. They got him by the nap of the neck and the seat of the bridges and threw him out of the synagogue. That's about what they did. They cast him out. But he knew he knew that Jesus was from God that gave him his sight. But these guys said, we don't know where he's from. We don't know about this fellow. And the guy that was healed said, are you kidding me? Who, can you tell me anybody else that's ever restored the sight of the blind? No. <laughs> Only God can do that. So he said, this man's got to be from God or he wouldn't have any power. So when Peter preached on that porch, and he said Moses prophesied about Christ. He didn't know it was Christ he was prophesying about. He just knew it was going to be another prophet. And then in verse 24, yes, Peter said, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. The Jews considered Samuel the chief of the prophets. They considered Samuel the chief of the prophets. Why? Because he led the nation of Israel. Before they had a king, before they had judges, Samuel led them. And that's in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 20. And you will see that. You will see that because of 1 Samuel 3 and 20 is why the Jews held him up as the chief of the prophets. So when Peter mentioned his name, he's mentioned two people here. He mentioned Moses, and now he's mentioned Samuel, two of the very most important people so far within their genealogical history as Jews. But he's not done. Look at verse 25. <clears throat> you are sons of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, uh oh, there's another three of the big guys. Saying Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When he says you are sons of the prophet, they are the descendants of those to whom the prophets were sent. It was to their forefathers that the prophets were sent. He's not saying you all are sons of the, the prophets. It's not all your dads were prophets. 
He's saying you are the sons. When the Bible uses that language, it says you are the sons of, of this prophet. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a biological father-son relationship. It's the fact that they were the sons of the prophets. It was their fathers that heard these prophets. It was their forefathers that, that heard Moses. It was their forefathers who lived under Samuel. It was their forefathers. And then he brings Abraham into it. So they are the descendants to those whom the prophets were sent, their forefathers. And they, these guys he's talking to right now, are Abraham's seed. See? They're Abraham's seed. He said, you, you're the son, son of those prophets, and in your seed all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. In other words, you are of Abraham. You are of Moses. You are of Samuel. And all of them pointed to Jesus. So why wouldn't you follow after Jesus? I mean, he's the one they were all pointing to, even though they didn't know the name. <clears throat> In verse 26, to you first, first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. Now, I would say that's not in favor with God, wouldn't you? Send him to bless you. How? In turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Peter said, God has sent Christ to you guys first. God has sent Christ to you guys first. Remember what Jesus told the disciples? Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember? Remember when the lady came and begged that her daughter would be, the demon would be released out of her daughter? And remember Jesus said, we don't give the bread to the little dogs or there won't be enough for the children. That was a statement saying, I have come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the lady said the right thing to him. She said, but even dogs get crumbs from the master's table. And boy, that sparked it. That done it right there. And he said, your daughter is going to be okay. <clears throat> you and I have got the crumbs of the salvation that God has drawn to the Jews. But I'll take it, won't you? <coughs> like, no, I got the water. Ran away here. I'm fine. I'm fine, but anytime you can get back with me, I'll be good. Yeah. I'm all right. I'll wait. I'll wait. Catch me up. <clears throat> yeah, I'm okay. I just have that one time. But anyway, it was the fact that Peter is, is getting them to understand that what God is doing right now is for their benefit. He is not working against them. He is working for them. He, he did not come to condemn them. Jesus himself said, For the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So this is what Peter is trying to, to get them to understand as they're building this foundation for this new church. So God sent Christ to them first. To turn them from sin means that God would forgive them if they will accept Jesus as the Messiah. That's why he came. See, the thing is, when he makes this statement, his servant Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That's how you're blessed. You're blessed by having your iniquities forgiven. You're blessed by being turned away your iniquities. Remember the word repent? Repent means to do what? Turn away. Go in a different direction. That's not possible without Christ. Couldn't do it without him. Peter wants him to understand. They, they knew they were sinners. That wasn't big news to them. They knew that the whole nation of Israel, <laughs> that God was mad at them. They knew that all along. In order to find favor with God, they had to do what God wanted them to do by way of the priest and following the sacrificial systems. That's why they sacrificed the bulls and the goats and the fellowship offerings and the Day of Atonement. And, and they were somehow hoping that they could find favor 
with God. The, you know, the, the normal Jew, the, you know, if you would say it, well, do you have favor with God? The average Jew would have told you back in those days, I don't know. I hope I do. I don't know. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I mean, I, I'm following the priests and giving the sacrifices. Of course, I may be cheating my brother on the side, and I may be... They weren't perfect people. I mean, it was still, they know that. And they know they weren't perfect people. And God knew they weren't perfect people. And the priests didn't forgive their sins, but they interceded for them for, to God for them. And that's the hope that they had. And now Peter says the fact that you need to be separated from your sin in order to have favor with God, God has done that for you through his servant. Jesus. He has done what you can't do. All you have to do is to believe in Him. Put your trust in Him. Accept Him as the Savior. Accept Him as the Messiah. Understand, He's the one that saves us. Peter said, that's all you, that's all you gotta do. And once you do that, then you will be blessed because you have turned from your iniquities. I think that's all I had on your questions. So, <clears throat> Peter is trying to sum up his sermon here at this point to try to get them to understand, as I said, that it is not a new religion. He is not taking them in a different direction. It's just now that God has changed the way that he has, that he has relationship with his people. Before, it was through the sacrifices of the bulls and the goats and the calves and and it was just a general, the general population of the Jews, they were represented to God by just certain factions within them, by certain priests. It was just, you know, they had the high priest, and the priest did the sacrifices, and if they wanted anything from God, they had to go to the priest. They had to take a sacrifice to the priest. If they had a disease, if they were sick, they had to go to the priest. It, it had to be, the priest had to do the intercession for them. It was, it was not about the people. And now Peter is saying, it's changed. God has come to you. He has come to you now by way of this man, Jesus. And this is proof that he's come to you. This lame man was given his strength back. Only God could do that. So that's, that's where they're at in his son. That's where he got to in there. So questions or comments? Oh, yes. When uh, the disciples were with Jesus up on the, the mountain, and Moses and Elijah came down, mm -hmm. and it said that they feared, yeah. was it that they all were covered with the cloud, or was it just Elijah and Moses that were covered in the cloud as, as they went up? Well, the way I, the way I understand it, and seeing it, is they, when they got there, they were heavy with sleep. They were tired. I mean, it had been a hard day for them. And they went to sleep, and Jesus took Peter and James up there with him on the mountain. And John, they got up there, and when he got up there, they, they went to sleep, and then he went up there for the reason of being transfigured, and then the transfiguration woke them up. See, when you look at it, as they woke up, they saw Moses and Elijah fading away. Now, the theological question to that is, was Moses and Elijah on the earth with him, or was Moses and Elijah in the air, encapsulated in, you know, like the angels that came to the shepherds? Were they actually on the ground or were? Don't know. Don't matter. They don't know. But as they, as they woke up, when all this was happening, they saw Moses. See, Peter was Luke's right-hand man in writing his gospel. Luke was not an eyewitness, but Peter was. That's why Peter's preaching his sermon on Solomon's porch. And he told Luke, this is what happened, Luke. As I was waking up, Moses and Elijah was going away. And I said, and that's why that line was in there. Peter said, Peter told Luke, Peter said, I said, 
Well, it's good that we're here. It's good that we're here to witness it. So let us make three tabernacles. That same as a temple. I mean, the tabernacle is what they had in the wilderness. That's a place of worship. It wasn't just a little house. Let's, let's make three temples. Let's make three tabernacles. Let's make one for Jesus, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and then the cloud come on them, on them, on the disciples. It got dark, and that's why I say it was a, it was a fearsome cloud. I mean, it, it wasn't just. They got to remember, it was at night they were up there, so it got even darker, and that cloud surrounded them. You ever been in darkness so thick you could feel it? That's what they did. They felt that. I'm sure the hair stood up on the back. And then when the voice came, that voice, man. See, that voice, the Jews understood about the cloud. And they understood about the voice. Because that's what happened on Mount Sinai. I mean, they knew that. And that voice said, this is my son. Hear him. That was a scary time. And then the cloud left. And Jesus was the only one there. So they got the message again. <laughs> you know that this is who you hear. This is who you listen to now. It's no longer Moses' word doesn't override his word. You know, Elijah's word doesn't, you know, the prophet doesn't override the words of Christ. It's not, it's not that there's a whole different religion here. <clears throat> He's still God. Still Christ, still the same God that did that. And that, that experience on that transfiguration is what is partly my opinion that called Peter to be died in the wool as a disciple past that point. If you witness something like that and you see that happen, that's why I think that Luke says they didn't tell anybody. See, he told Luke that this is years down the road that Luke penned his gospel. It happened, but the disciples didn't go down to the market and say, guess what happened to us last night? Everybody said, yeah, right. Sure it did. No, really, we were up there and we saw this and Jesus come in and we were scared to death and he was transfigured and they're like, yeah, sure it did. You know, that's what it was. Because Jesus would tell the people many times, you know, his brothers told him, he said, go on up to the feast and make yourself known. Go on up to the feast of Passover and do some kind of big miracle. Do something to prove to everybody who you are. And Jesus said several times, my hour has not yet come because it, it wouldn't take away the glory from the cross, which is what they had to understand. John tells us in his gospel that a lot of the things that Jesus told them about his death and his resurrection they did not understand until he was already resurrected. It didn't click for them until it had already happened. That's why I say we're kind of at a disadvantage because we know too much. We can jump ahead in the story. <clears throat> and, we, and we think sometimes because we can do that, that these people should have known that. They didn't know that. If God lets me do Nicodemus Sunday morning, if I've got time, how long is that music? Oh, no. It's 45 minutes. It's scary. It's 25 minutes. Yeah. Well, I'll take another hour. That would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's Christmas. But in studying, you know, looking at the Pharisees and studying them, and I've done that through, through looking at the book of Acts, when you look at what the religion was before Christ came and, and got us to understand and got them to understand. You know, we give the Pharisees and, and you know, the scribes a bad rap. But you got to understand, those guys, they had no idea what we know. Jesus hadn't been to the cross. He hadn't been resurrected. He was just another human. But the difference was he could do miracles. <laughs> I mean, he could do miracles. No man ever done a miracle, just like that blind guy told, told the Pharisees. Who else has ever made a blind man see? He's got to be from God. Well, Nicodemus made that statement. He said, we know you're from God. But yet they didn't understand why God had chosen 
to do that because their belief was and still is for the Orthodox Jews that when the real Messiah comes, according to them, he's going to bring peace with him and we're not going to have all this turmoil. So everything that's going on in the world right now is proof to them that Jesus was not the Messiah. So they think, or the world wouldn't be in the shape it's in. But we know different. We know different. We know that the millennial is coming. We know that there's a rapture coming. We know that there's a tribulation coming. And then we know there's a millennial coming. And that's when these prophecies of worldwide peace is going to be fulfilled. So that's, that's what they were dealing with in trying to get that church <clears throat> off of the ground and trying to get people to believe what they were having to teach. They were, they were up against it. They were up against it. So I hope I answered your question by telling you how to make a watch. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Anybody else? We still got five minutes. Yeah. It, it has to be, and, and here's my answer on that, it has to be the Holy Spirit told them. See, when, when Luke penned that gospel and Matthew and Mark, they all heard recorded it, when they penned their gospels, the Holy Spirit brought back to their remembrance. So, in other words, for Peter to know who that was, it had to be revealed to him by Jesus. Jesus had to tell him, this is Moses and Elijah. Peter, there's no way Peter would automatically know who that was. He couldn't have known, but remember, Jesus is there. <clears throat> and he saw them leaving. Well, when he saw these men leaving, he probably had no idea who they were. <laughs> he just saw, and Jesus said, you know, this is Moses and Elijah. And that's when he said, well, why? Let us make three tabernacles if that's who those guys were. See, it's all it all fits in, into place if you if you put it into that perspective as to what, what they knew and what they didn't know when the Gospels were written. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's how he's able to make that known to them. There's, there's no way they could have known. You know, when Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, Abraham longed to see your day. You know, Abraham wanted to see this day. But he didn't get to see this day. And the Pharisees jumped up and said, what do you know about Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. And Abraham's been dead hundreds of years. Well, they forgot they were talking to the Ancient of Days. <laughs> they are talking to the God of Abraham. That's how he knew Abraham. And he didn't say, because I made Abraham. What Jesus said was, before Abraham was, I am. I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He said before Abraham was, I am. Remember when Moses said, who am I going to tell Pharaoh to send us? I am. That I am. That made that connection right there. So they had their job cut out for them. That's why I say this is an excellent study in understanding where we are as a church in the world today. Now this is the basic foundation of what it was formed off of. And then we're going to see as we go through this book where the complications come into it. And, and that's why you hear me say sometimes man has messed it up. But God still has it on track. <laughs> that, that's just how it works. But does that answer? After making a watch. I don't have two word answers. Y'all notice that? <clears throat> Nobody else don't answer that. <laughs> I don't play. I don't play. <clears throat> but, but does it make sense? But because all of it, all of it doesn't make sense. But but we have to know the basics of it in order if you're going to be a disciple and you're going to be an evangelist. You, we all know there are things that we can't explain. There are things that we don't know. I understand that. But when it comes to salvation, there is nothing we don't know. 
in regards to who Jesus is. There's no question about who he is. That, that's why I said before, what, and it may not be a bad thing, maybe I'm wrong, but when they put the words in red, <clears throat> that changed a lot with the scriptures. <clears throat> because now you have people that say to you, well, Jesus never said nothing about that. <laughs> if it's in Genesis, it comes from Jesus. He's the word. It doesn't have to be in red for Jesus to have said it. You know, <laughs> that's, that's it. He is the word. If it's in Genesis or Revelation, it doesn't have to be written in red. He's the word. The words that are in red are those things he said to them while he was there, while he was there with them on the earth, while he was there with them in person. Yeah. There's a song that was out years and years ago that the uh, author, well, the writer, started from Genesis and went to Revelation, and he shared what who Jesus was in each. Every book. It's, it's a beautiful song. Every book. Yeah. You, you can you can find you can find a reference to him. Although in that Old Testament they did not know that it was, excuse me, going to be Jesus of Nazareth. God knew that, but like Moses did not know that, and David did not know that. They knew there was going to be a Messiah, but they could not name him. You couldn't have said Moses. What's his name going to be? This prophet that God's going to raise up. What's his name going to be? The closest we get is when Isaiah said, For his name shall be called Wonderful, shall be called Counselor, shall be called Prince of Peace. He will be Emmanuel, which is God with us. Well, why didn't they name Jesus Emmanuel if Isaiah said his name is going to be Emmanuel? Because Gabriel said, Name him Jesus, which means God is salvation. So does that contradict Isaiah saying he's named it? No, Jesus is God with us. Same God. Isaiah just didn't know he was going to come from Nazareth. Isaiah didn't know exactly who it was. So it's all that. It's interesting stuff. Anybody else? Lord, we thank you tonight. Thank you so much for these who come and they listen so intently and those who tune in. Father, there's no way that we can be Bible experts and we don't need to be because we've got you. We've got you in our hearts. And you told the disciples and you tell us we don't have to worry about the answers that we're going to have to give because it will be you that answers through us. Yes, there's things we don't know. Absolutely. There's things you haven't allowed us to know for our own benefit. But those things that we need to know, there's no doubt about them. There's no question about them. You've revealed them unto us. It is our duty to accept it. I always remember, Lord. I always remember because you bring it back to my memory. When you say the volume of the book is written about me, but they will not come to me that they might have life. So I pray tonight that you help us as your disciples to come to you so that we'll have that life and to be better evangelists to this lost world out here that has, that has no idea how much you love them and what it is you have done for them and that you don't want to condemn any of them, but it is your will that they should all be saved. Help us to get that message out to them. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen and amen.